Hello, this is the Morse Institute Library's Veterans Oral History Project. Today we are continuing with our interview series. It is September 26, 2006. My name is Joan Craig, Community Relations Coordinator for the Morse Institute Library. And today I'm very pleased to invite you to meet Lillian M. Boyd. Lillian is from Natick. Hello Lillian, thank you for coming. Hello. I'm going to ask you a few questions, a little bit of background about yourself, and then about what you did during World War II, before, during, and after, okay? Um, um, could I ask you, where do you live right now? In Natick. In Natick. And mm -hmm. did you grow up in Natick? No, I did not. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Waltham. Tell us what Waltham was like when you were growing up. It was wonderful because everyone helped everyone else. It was way back during the Depression, we had that too there, but everybody helped. And then during World War II, when we saw army men arrive at the door, someone else's door, we knew what was happening. And what was happening? They were there to tell them that someone was gone. Someone had passed away. Yes. Talk a little bit about yes. the Depression. How old were you approximately during the Depression oh, years? Very young, very young. But How I, did it affect your family? Like most every other family. In what they way? Found, they found work, they found jobs. The fathers back then, they were uh, digging up roadways and stuff. Mm -hmm. I think it was, was it the WPA Works Project Administration? I think that's what it was called then. And, and they did find jobs that way. They were out there if you went out looking for them. How many were in your family? Just my mother, my father, my brother, and myself. And was your brother older or younger? He was younger. Younger than you? Yes, I lost him at a very early age. I'm sorry to hear that. The Korean when, War. In the Korean War. He was a serviceman in the Korean War? He was the gunner on a spy, the spy planes that went out. He was the only gunner on tail, bottom. He was doing what he loved. When he was a little, little boy, he used to tear pieces of bread at the dinner table and make guns and planes out of them. And all around the door frames, all over the house, were pictures of airplanes. So at a young age, he thought he always wanted to do something like that. He knew. That. And he now, was 20. When he was 20 when he passed away. Yes. That's very sad. Yes. Getting back to the Depression time, what do you remember about going to the market or what you couldn't find at the markets when you, when you were... Um, planning dinners or things like oh, that? There wasn't much food around then, to tell you the truth. But as long as you ate healthy, you always tried to find greens, because mm -hmm. you didn't have lettuce and stuff like that in the winter anyway. It wasn't shipped. There were no fresh vegetables and fruits to begin with way, way back that far, not during the winter months. During that period of time, did your father do work on the roads? Was that his yes. job? Yes, yes he did. And was your mother working or was she stay at home? No, she was at home during that time. But they went to work before the war ended at the Waltham Watch. They Both of them did? There. or No, just she did. He, she was trying to enlist and he, they finally took him, but he was, too, he was young, but they finally took him. But by the time they took him, the war was over. So I see. He was very disappointed. What was your life like before World War II broke out? Normal. Just a normal, plain life. I loved school. I loved learning. And that was, I made that my life, whatever I could learn. And prior to the war, 
Did you know anything about Europe or about Asia? Did you learn anything in school or yes. around the dinner table? Yes, during the war I took Latin and I also took a course in German. And did that give you any kind of an insight into... Yes, it did. In what way? I'm happy in sight. I, I, I just knew sooner or later, someday there would be a problem. Their feelings and their way of life were so different from ours. Did you follow any kind of international events, any of the aggressions that might have been going on prior to our coming into the war? Yeah, Germany, we always listened to the radio and, and got this, and I, I kept saying there's going to be a war, but no one, <laughs> I was just a girl. No one paid attention to ladies that talk, man talk. <laughs> and, and so you had an interest and you would make comments, but people didn't take them seriously. Mm -hmm. When you mention listening to the radio, um, is it similar to the way people watch television now today? Did you listen to the radio often? Oh, yes. We loved our radios, but we did it in a family group. The children would sit on the floor, the father would have the big easy chair, and the mother the other easy chair opposite. But my brother and I would be right on the floor hugging that radio. Oh, yes. And would you listen to the news also? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, December 7th, 1941. Where were you that day? Do you remember? I think it was a school day. I was, had just arrived home. I had the radio on. And what did you hear? That we were at war. And, and I said, finally, we should have been at it sooner. I thought sooner. And so you heard from the radio that we had been bombed at yes, Pearl Harbor? Pearl Harbor. Before the attack on Pearl Harbor, did you think the United States would go to war? Yeah, I hoped they would. Why? I prayed they would because of England. They needed our help. So you would get word about what was happening in England and oh, in London? Oh, yes. And then when we went to the movies, they'd have the Pathé News, it was called, in between the two movies that we saw or before the news. And uh, they told you everything they knew and could so tell you. So for our listening audience, we may want to expand on going to the movies. Oh, yes. How often would you go to the movies? Saturdays and Sundays. Saturdays and Sundays. And during mm -hmm. that time period, they would have newsreel reports? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And it would tell you about what was happening in Europe? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you and remember show anything? Some pictures. Some too. pictures also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And who would you go to the movies with? My girlfriend. Your girlfriend. Do you remember how much it cost? It well, right then, it started at a dime, then it went to a quarter, but we always got in free because her sister was the head teller there at the movie theater. Plus she worked in the office, the manager's office that was the manager of the theater. But the theaters were so beautiful. In what inside. way were they beautiful? Oh, they were carpeted in such luxurious carpeting. And was the seating comfortable? Oh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And where? Was this in Waltham that yes, you would go to these Yes, there were movies? three theaters. That was the Embassy Theater. And there was a Central Square Theater because the Embassy Theater wouldn't accept Gone with the Wind because he said, I don't give a damn. He said the word damn. But finally, the Central Square Theater did take it and allow it, and that was shocking. It was shocking, yeah. Yes, because I remember I went and saw that with an English officer from an English submarine. You went on a here. date with this officer? Yes. Okay. The, you went out with them. Yes, yes, I'd call it a date because my English teacher from school was there. And she came up and said, 
Lillian, how are you? And she's just looking at him. He was very handsome. Now, how did you meet him? Uh, we had parties, and they came a lot of the military. They sh Waltham became the very military place to be because they were up at Fort Devens, the army, and that they brought them down on buses. They bussed them down when they weren't on call. When they that, were on leave, maybe, or had yes, a little time off? Yes, because that was the closest place where there was a town. A city type of town? Yes, like with Waltham. movie theaters with movie. Okay. and uh, all the things like that. But one good thing about it was they also, you couldn't find alcohol in Waltham then. It, it was a dry town? It was a dry town, okay. which made it. I thought very good with this army and navy you know, moving into town. So when they would come into town, you'd have an opportunity to meet with them? Yes, they had dances mm -hmm. there too. And in Boston, I forget what church it was. It's the first one going up. I forget the name now. But they clean all the aisles out. And they had dances there all the time too. Mm -hmm. How were old were you when you would go to these dances? Oh, I didn't get to go, I had to watch until I got old enough, I could think about 17. You were chaperoned. You were chaperoned oh, by? Oh, yes. By teachers or? Teachers, principals, people from your town. Oh, yes, indeed, you were chaperoned. And you, you couldn't, you couldn't, you, you could dance, but you couldn't sit and hold hands. And, Getting back, we'll come back to the dancing in a minute, but getting back to hearing about Pearl Harbor, you kind of alluded to the fact that you heard it on the radio. Did you also have neighbors that were out talking about it? Do you remember the neighborhood? Yes, they came out in their yards because the yards were more close then, and everybody said it's about time. And you thought that too, that it was about time? Oh, I thought they should, I was just praying they'd have done it sooner, that they needed help so badly. And once this was declared, how did your life differ after Pearl Harbor? Because I'd been working at the Waltham Watch. I went down when I was 15 during the summer and you were allowed to work three days a week when you were 15 in certain parts of the watch factory and you were very closely supervised. You know, you younger girls were kept together and no gentleman could be in the room you were working. So it was more segregated than oh, yes. men and women in different areas of oh, yes. Waltham Watch Company? Yes, and then as I grew older I got right into where I learned to to watch together and then the radium was it radium watches I think it was radium Bonnie knows right radio that you could know that you could see at night mm-hmm yeah they came out and they got a big contract for the army they were after that okay we'll get to that again too but during this period of time when we mm -hmm. finally decided to get involved in World War mm -hmm. II, did you have family and friends then who listed in the armed services? Uh, some of my neighbors, cousins and brothers did, my girlfriend's brothers. Mm -hmm. And did you write to servicemen? All the time. Yes. And did you, th did you th think that these letters were important? To Very them? important to them. Why? They just read them and reread them. They were censored, very highly censored, of course, the letters. Would you tell them about what was going on at home or what you were hearing about go what was going on? No, what was going on at home. Mm -hmm. That's what they wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. And a lot were from out in the West and Midwest and the hills of everywhere, the whole country. And a lot of the parents didn't know how to write. 
Could you speak up? I'm sorry. They didn't know how to write. They didn't know how to write. Lips. Okay. No. Mm -hmm. no. Which is nothing shameful at the time if they weren't taught. So what you're saying is the servicemen really enjoyed letters from you yes. because yes. they would get some information. And they enjoyed that. writing them when they had time. Sure. It gave them something. Even in the trenches, they were writing letters while they had a breather between the two going at each other. During that period, did you know of any servicemen who did not return? Yes. Were they classmates or friends? It was my best girlfriend's brother. And how did they find out about it? They came to the house. Mm -hmm. It was difficult for them. Mm -hmm. Did they talk about it to you? Oh, we, we discussed it because, as I say, I was like another daughter to them, too. I'm a daughter to a lot of people. Back so that then. had to be difficult for you, too. Yes, yeah. very. He was with one of the dearest persons you'd ever, kindest, dearest persons you'd ever want to meet in your life, what you would call a real good man and gentleman. And where was he when he passed away? Do you remember? He was in a battle. In Europe? Or in the Pacific? The Pacific. In the Pacific, I see. You um, alluded to working at the Waltham Watch Company. Mm -hmm. Was this your first job? Yes, it was. And you did this job during the war years? Yes, I did. Uh -huh. So what time would you go in in the morning, approximately? Do you remember? Oh. Eight. I think when the war started, we went in earlier, 7, 7.30. And how long a day did you have? Oh, some went at four, some at six, depending on what you did there. And you mentioned earlier about putting watches together. Were you on an assembly line? It, it wasn't like a line. You each had your own chair and your own, like a desk in front of you. And you would assemble some? You assemble. I, they taught me to assemble the insides of the watch. But I told them it got so boring because you only had to do 10 boxes a day, and I had 10 boxes done in two or three hours. So after those two or three hours, what did you do? Just went around saying, can I do more if you want to? Are you tired? Are you tired? I said, no. So I did more. Then finally, I was so bored, I said, I can't do this anymore. It's repetitious. I can't do anything repetitious. I, it just drives me insane. And he said, would you like to be an inspector? Yes. And what did an inspector do? She, once people put the watch together, the inside, they brought it they were wooden boxes, yay big, with glass top, and they brought them over and set them on your, what you call a, a table or a desk, more like a desk, and they set them over to you, and then you went through them all and checked everything out that was inside to make sure it was done right. Do you then, remember what your salary was at that time? That's the one thing. I know they paid a good salary for its time and for young people like me. But to remember it, I can't remember it to save my soul. Now, you mentioned earlier that you young women were separated from the men. Were you treated differently than the man doing the same job? No. no. So it was equal? Very equal. That's why I liked it there, Do you think too. the pay was equal, too? Yes, the pay was equal. Yes. And do you think they finally let the men come in with us, what were left, young men who weren't old enough to go. So when you say what were left, it's because others others a lot of the women left to go into the service. They the wanted to be nurses. Okay. Army or Navy nurses. So quite a few left. And others left getting married because they wanted to marry before whoever was going off to war. 
And did they lose a lot of their men too for that same reason for going oh, off yes. to war? Oh yes, yes. That's why a lot of more women came to work there. They took their place, and then they found out that the women were actually <laughs> doing better with these watches. They had a lighter touch. The women had a lighter touch. Yes. Do you think your work contributed to the war effort? I know it did. How? Because when they came out with, I always get that mixed up, radium, I think it was, when it first came out that you could see at night, we were enlisted by the armed forces to produce these watches in a hurry because every soldier on the field wanted one. This made it wonderful because you could, when you made plans, you attack from this side at such and such a time, we'll attack from that side. This enabled them to see in the dark. So they could coordinate their yes. time. And, yes, and, and so they were given the a time and they had to be put together precisely right there. So the did second. that mean the line, for lack of a better word, of, mm -hmm. of workers had to do more than 10 boxes of watches? At a time. They could. They were told to do as many as they possibly could without tiring themselves, but they didn't like you looking at it. I guess we didn't understand that at first. This was not a good thing to be working around for a certain length of time. Because of the Radium. materials used. Yes. Yes. Did anyone suffer any effects from that? Not that I ever knew of. I certainly haven't. Didn't. Did you live nearby the watch factory? I could walk to work. You walk to work. Yes. What training did you get to do your work? They they just came around and uh, sit, they sat by, by you and they showed you how to put it together and then you had to start putting it together for them. Of course, we forgot to put this in or that in. <laughs> <laughs> at first, but they said, don't, do not get excited, don't get excited, you will learn, but you won't learn if you get excited, it's very precise, it's got to be very so precise. So they had patience in training you? Oh yes, yes, and they also loved me because some man came in, I don't know who or what he was, um, he had to do with the watches and he had to do with the army and this and that. And he's running around and he's standing around back of me. And back then I had long hair down to here. But I didn't want to, you couldn't have anything inside those watches. A piece of hair would, nothing could be inside those watches. So I used to braid it and wear it down my back. And I felt this hand reach out and grab my ponytail, so I said, ah, let go of me, you, standing there in the big uniform with some general or something, and he says, oh, sorry, dear, sorry. Mm. <laughs> and he says, I'd like to see all the hair tied back like this from now on. If you don't want to braid it, tie it at the top and tie it at the bottom, a bow at the top, a bow at the bottom. I, all the girls were glaring at me. <laughs> Did you wear any kind of a uniform at that time, or? Yes, we did. In what way? It was blue, and we put it on. You just put your, some of them were blue and some white, and you just put your arms through, and then have someone tie you up, the, like a doctor's, somewhat. Okay. And so you could wear regular you. clothes, but you would wear yes. this cover-up. Yes, once you got into making the insides. Did you feel that you contri your contributions were appreciated even after the war? Yes. How, how did you hear about that? I mean, did you hear from... They came, a lot of the military came out of Boston to Waltham, and they would get us all together. We wouldn't all fit together inside in one room, so we would all be outside and the military would come make their little speech and thank us and thank us because they were making other things downstairs way down under the factory which we that's where they dip this in gold for me oh you but can show were, that yes they were making things down there that 
we didn't know about at the time. We, was it top secret? Yes. So oh, yes. You couldn't get in the watch factory anymore without a pass hanging around your neck. So you all had identification Oh, passes. yes, mm -hmm. yes. Why don't you show the audience what oh, you brought this. with you and explain it? Well, I taught kindergarten at the church for a while, and I had about 35 children, and this gentleman helped me because that's a lot for one person to keep charge of. And we had this cross there. He had brought it in, and we used this cross there. It's non-denominational. And when he left, he said, I won't be coming back. He says, my days are numbered now. And he said, I'm going back to my home where I lived. And I said, oh, I'll miss you. He said, and I shall miss you. He said, and he picked this up, and he said, this is yours. I said, oh, I can't take that. I cannot take that. I can't do that. And he said, there isn't anyone else in the world I would part with it. He said, this has helped a good many people. And you've had it all these years. Yes. That's wonderful. That's a very nice. Yes. Who was he? His name was Reverend Charles Fromer, F-R-O-M-M-E-R. -M -M -E and was he in Waltham? Uh, we were up in Natick then. You were in Natick, Natick at that Natick. point in time? Yes. Okay. All right, why don't you put that yes. back down and we'll ask you a few more questions. During this time period when the war was going on, um, how did you hear about the war effort? You mentioned the newsreels at the movies. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned your radio. Mm -hmm. Did you have newspapers? Yes, but mostly we got more, I think, from the troops that came down from Fort Devens. And the one thing they loved the most was being invited to homes. Private homes. Private homes for a meal. For a dinner. Just or to sit around the table with a family again. And you would do that? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there was always room for one more. You could just, we had those big, round, wooden tables, if you, you probably don't remember, that go way, way back. And they, you could take them apart and put inserts in them. A leaf in them. Yes, yes. two or three leaves mm -hmm. in them. And there was always room for another one. At do you remember table. what you might have for dinner or for, for a lunch or a Sunday meal? Oh, whatever was around, they, they didn't care what it was as long, but it would be meat and vegetables, and, but if you made homemade cakes or stuff like that, oh, the desserts, they loved the homemade desserts. And now during that time, was there a lot of rationing? You talk about making desserts, was there rationing of butter, sugar, meats? Yes. And I had a brother three years younger than me, almost three years younger. And he went and got his first job, which was just around the corner from where I was, over across the street. And this place had all kinds of goodies in it during the war that they rationed out. And it was butter and sugar and all that nice things that you would need to cook with. So he was able to get these things for you? So not only were you able to go to the movies because of your friend, but your brother had a connection in getting you some things that otherwise might be difficult. Yes, because the manager told him, because my brother said, don't pay me. Take the money you'd pay me and let that pay you. Now All when right. things were rationed, did mm -hmm. you have tickets to get them? Rationing cards. Rationing cards. Tell us about yes. them if you remember them. Vaguely very vaguely, but the neighbors would spread the word. Someone in the neighborhood would stand out in the front lawn and holler, they've got um, sugar down here, or they've got coffee. Coffee came in and yell where it was, and everybody would immediately grab their purses and stuff, because as I say, the stores were much closer by then. So coffee yes. was at a premium, and they would take their rationing card and go down to get coffee if it was at one of the local stores. Yes. 
What about nylon stockings? Yes. So many people listening to this may not realize that prior to other types of... Um, Down on Moody Street, there was Grover Cronin, Park Snows, and Waltham, or big stores. Someone, it, someone always went down there every day anyway and looked around. Someone would get the phone. The phones would start ringing all over town. There's nylons down at Park Snows or something, and everybody would run down to see. Or if you had a friend there she would, that worked in the store, they would call you and say, get down here now, fast. Now, nylon replaced silk, correct? Yes. You used to have silk stockings? Mm -hmm. Do you remember if they were expensive? No. No. So then you went from silk to nylon, mm -hmm. and it was rationed also. Mm -hmm. Did you collect anything for the war, scraps of anything? We've heard, I think, historically about metals or aluminums or yeah, paper. Yeah, scrap metals. Mm -hmm. Anything else that you remember collecting? Paper, rubber, rags, anything like that? Papers, newspapers we collected. And then would someone come by or did you drop yes, them off? Yes, you put them out. You put them out. On the mm -hmm. sidewalk. We had sidewalks back then, nice sidewalks. You did. Okay. Do you remember participating in any blackouts? Yes, a few times. Uh, some of them were just testing to see how well it was being done. And would you participate in your home? Yes. What would you do? You draw, you, uh, everybody, well, we had drapes then. Everybody had long drapes then. So you just draw your drapes, uh, shut off the lights, have a candle on the floor out of, behind a chair or something where it couldn't be seen. You, you could get it pretty black. And did you have things like, we've heard of victory gardens. There were there, but not too many where we were because it was more city-fied mm -hmm. out farther, yes. And what, the, did, you, did you know of people who had victory gardens? Not too well, okay. not too well. And what about war bond drives? We've heard about that yes. too. Yes. Yeah. It, did you participate in any I of had those? A, I had a few, but it was expensive back then. So it's you could purchase a war bond, but it was a little beyond some yes, people's means. Yes, because money really didn't pick up until right after the war. Did you develop any close friendships during the war years? Oh, yes. And who were some of these people? Were they some of your co-workers or neighbors? Co-workers, but there's only, they just passed away on me. <laughs> and because there were five of us that worked in the watch factory and we went out every Saturday and Sunday together, the five of us, because that was the only way you'd go to Boston. We'd love to go to Boston because there was an eatery in there and it's still there. I saw it not long ago when we were in. I said, Bonnie, look across the street. See that building where the windows are right close to the sidewalk. They're right along the sidewalk down under. That's where we used to go. Do you remember the name of it? I try to remember, and the name is on the outside of it. And oh. that you, now when you mentioned five of you, were, was it five young women? Yes. Oh, and yes. And how would you get in there? By train and trolley. We were in Waltham. We take the train to North Station. And you would get go off to there. dinner? Yes, we'd walk up. But then, of course, during the service, it got so we were being followed every time we were walking up by a crew of sailors or soldiers, you know, in back of us, high girls, and we just, um, and, um, you know, we just went away. And you felt oh. safe doing that? Yes. Once in a while, we'd say, hi, boys. We didn't turn around, but we'd just say, hi, like that, over the back of our heads and keep the steady walk. And we'd go up, and the five of us would sit in the table while the generals and 
whatever sailors went and sat at another table because that table would only hold four to five. So we made sure we got a table, a safe table, right up in the window. <laughs> now, were you of drinking age then? I don't know how old you had to be. I've never had a drink in my life. Lillian, tell us a little bit about some of the other activities that you would do in your free time. Paddle boats. Up, that was up by Norumbega Park, too. They had canoes and paddle boats. And for people who may not know about Norumbega Park, it's my understanding that that's where uh, the Marriott Hotel is no. near yes. Route 128, mm -hmm. right in the Newton Waltham mm -hmm. area, correct? That's where the totem pole was, and ballroom. The totem pole ballroom. Tell us about that. Oh, that was something to grow up for, and, and when you got old enough, you could participate too. And we go down all the wonderful band leaders. Well, name some Thank of the, the people time. that you re remember listening to. Oh, who was it? Did you say Benny no. Goodman? Benny Goodman was there. All of the, the big ones were there and came for dances. And they would bus and trolley. There was a trolley that came out there, too. And the girls would go. You'd dress up and you'd wear your long white gloves and your white piquet dress. And and you'd sit there with your being watched over by teachers and so it was it. chaperoned oh very much so yes and then army navy marines would show up in full dress uniform and they were allowed in brought in and they were chaperoned right the men chaperoned right in back of them what they would do. It was usually an older officer that came with them and chaperoned them, made sure they minded. That and everyone they would, behaved appropriately? Oh, yes. And it was beautiful, or all over stuffed chairs and two seater sofas. But you were watched like hawks. But you would dance with these oh, yes. servicemen? Yes, and yes. And that's when a lot of them said, I'd love to visit your house, you know, and if you were so choosing, you could invite them out to dinner to meet your family. And often was this Sunday dinner? Yes. And was it in the afternoon versus yes. the evening? Because back oh, growing yes. up, that was a lot more um, popular, wasn't it, to yes. have sun a large meal at, on Sunday well, afternoon? Well, not only that. When it got dark and there were gentlemen walking out around there, you... You were either in with your family or you had your daddy tailing about three quarters up the road and back of you someplace, just walking nonchalantly and back. And talk a little bit about going out on the paddle boats. Explain the paddle boats if you can. Those paddle boats, you, you, well, what's it shaped like? A canoe you just got down and sat inside and then you both turned your feet you turn them with your feet around and around. So almost like pedaling. And one of the boys in the Navy was lived right around the corner from me. I'd known since I was, we grew up together practically around the corner, going back and forth to school. We didn't have anything to do with each other. You know, he was a boy, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but he, when he went in the Navy, I remember one day, come into Boston with me. He says, I want to get new outfit, Navy outfit. He says, I don't like the material. They have better, you can go buy them in Boston. They're made for the Navy, but they're strictly Navy made, but they're much better surge material in them. I said, oh, okay. So we went in and we got fitted. So when we came home, he says, let's go up to Norm Bigger and go riding around the paddle boats. I says, okay, good. And I had my of course, you wore dresses when you went out then with the lady you didn't have pants on. So I said, all right. So I get in there and wrap the dress around me, and I got in, and then he got in. So he just bought this beautiful, and it cost him a fortune, tailor-made. So I said, oh, look at that water lily out there. I want that water lily. 
So we paddled over towards it. I'm like, I can't reach it. I can't reach it. Have you got to have that water, Lily? I said, mm-hmm. I'll get it for you. So he climbed out, tried to put his foot on the pontoon, which he got on the pontoon and everything. Unknowns to us, they had just repainted the paddle boats. So when he got back to get into the paddle boat, this beautiful new custom-made sailor uniform was covered with silvery white paint. Oh my. And it started to pour and thunder and lightning and my long hair was hanging down on my kneecaps. And I was sopping wet in this dress. And we were both sopping. And they had to send a boat out to rescue us because the paddles were broken. They broke down. Everything went wrong that could go wrong in that storm. Good afternoon. Today is October 24th, 2006. And this is a continuation of our Veterans Oral History interview of Lillian Boyd. We started that interview in September, and we're completing it today. Good afternoon, Lillian. Good afternoon. My name is Joan Craig, and I'm Community Relations Coordinator at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. Today, Randy Brewer from Pegas Natick Pegasus is also here videotaping this interview. We're going to start where we finished off at the last interview, Lillian, and that entails information that you can give us about after the war. And after it ended, did you continue doing the same job that you were doing at the watch factory? Yes. You did. For how long? Hmm. Too Approximately. Long. Oh, a couple of years, probably. And then what made you not work there anymore? My husband didn't want me to work there anymore. So between the war, the end of the war, and that two-year period, you got married. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And did you have children at that time? Oh, no. Mm -hmm. No. I stopped when I had You her. stopped working once you got married. Yes. Uh, along with others, such as those that had been working during the war, women working, like yourself, we, we always refer in this day and age to the Rosie the Riveters, um, mm -hmm. people, women who went into the factories. Do you remember any stories about that? Oh, yes, yes. The men that owned these places were amazed that the women working were superior to the men who had been working before they joined and went in the service. What was it like for you and for your friends to discontinue working after you were so dependable during the war? Do you remember what your feelings were like? Yes, because the men as they returned were practically say they didn't say it in so many words, but it was, okay, back to the kitchen and the cooking and the housework. We'll take over. They would take yeah. over, you would go back into the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And did, did you, as friends with your other women friends, did you mm -hmm. talk about this at mm -hmm. all? Oh, yes, we did. We didn't like it. You didn't like it at all? No. But we did it fall on deaf ears with your husband? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think it was just the sign of the times back then? No. Uh, men's attitude towards women were completely different than they are now. Right. They, they wouldn't dare <laughs> say anything now. But no, we've arrived. We'll take over. Sure. We'll take over again. Looking back, you belonged in the kitchen. Their mothers were in the kitchen. That's where they saw their mothers. And, and they, they felt wanted, the wives should they be also. The wifey in the kitchen, like mom. Mm -hmm. Looking back on the news coverage during the war, do you think you 
and your uh, friends, family, and neighbors received accurate information about the war? No. In what way? A lot of times. Oh, they told us hardly anything. And the mail, as I said, when it arrived, most every sentence was blotted out. Some of them weren't worth receiving. You couldn't make head and a tail. So a lot of the letters you received were censored? Oh, all. Mm -hmm. What about in the newspapers themselves? Do you think you got good coverage from the newspapers? We barely read anything about it in the newspapers. What do you think then and now regarding the war effort, especially because now you hear such controversy about what is happening current day. Mm -hmm. Was there that sense of controversy back then or was there a sense no. of pride? What was it? Oh, they were, they begged to go. They couldn't be, wait to be old enough to be accepted. So they were more proud Oh, yeah, they want a war, we'll give them a war. Mm -hmm. this, this is our country. If you love your country, you, you'll fight for it. And back during World War II, that's exactly the oh, feeling? Oh, yes, yes. And the yes. families felt that way also? You hated to see them go, but you were very proud sure. of them when they went. What? In our conversation that you and I have had, you mention George Patton in, mm -hmm. in a very positive light. What are your feelings about him and explain why? Well, he was the one that everybody said, you know, you've got a few towards the end. You always have a few that started complaining, you know, and they were frightened over there. They didn't want to be over there, which I don't blame them. It wasn't very pleasant. but. Uh, you know, too many are dying for the country and this and that. And he says, you're not here to die for the company, your country. Let the next, the other SOB die for his country. And that's what he put it on. And that lifted their spirit because he was right in front with them. He was right there with them. He had a presence. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And he says, you're not here to die for your country. Who's, who's saying that? Hmm. Now, would you hear those things on newsreels or in the paper, if you got uh, a paper? It's once in a while you get it on a newsreel when you went to the movie theater. They had a newsreel that lasted all of about five minutes. You weren't told too much, but things like that, because they gave you a feeling of up. Mm -hmm. A positive yes. feeling. Yes, and you, and you agreed with it, too. I don't think there was anyone that I knew that didn't, that objected to going. Quite often through historic times, people will say, where were you when um, certain incidences happened? Do you remember where you were when they declared that war was officially over? Hmm. Or do you remember the feelings that you had once you heard that? Oh, very mixed feelings. In what way? We women then we sort of knew we were going to be. Let's go back to the kitchen and cook deal. And none of us felt that way anymore. We really liked working. If you had children. We believed you should stay home and take care of these children. But if you could work, a lot of women did work part time. They worked nights when their husbands came back. So conceivably, you could have been the um, foundation. Your generation could actually have been the foundation for women of today who think nothing of working and raising families at the same time. The only you difference is. We felt that mothers should be home with the children until they reached a certain age. Perhaps school age, is that something you maybe would have considered, mm, or older? Into school, I would say probably until junior high. Stay with them. 
finishing up this interview, is there one thought or memory you'd like to share, not only with your family, but with the community and with future generations about what you experienced back in the 1940s versus today? You don't want me to tell you. Something that you can say on tape. I feel a big disappointment for this country. Why? Right now. Because I think everything that's being done now is being done in a They don't want to do it. They have no they I think they happier the way they are now than they would be the way we are because they were brought up differently than we were. They, they probably can't help. Do you think it had something My to... My daughter was brought up differently. Do you think it has something to do with the fact that your generation s suffered through many hardships mm -hmm. whereas perhaps your daughter's generation and current generations haven't mm -hmm. seen the hardships that the U.S. went through. Do you think that has something to do with it? Mm -hmm. A little bit of hardship never hurt anyone. Lillian Boyd, we'd like to thank you very much for coming in today, for giving us this interview and a different perspective on what life was like for the women during that time period in World War II. Thank you for coming in. You're welcome. You're welcome, and I also enjoyed you bringing the memories back to me. Thank you. I really have enjoyed it. It was better.